Before delving deeper into atomic theory, we need to quickly review the concepts of electromagnetic radiation. Let's start by defining wavelength and frequency. Wavelength is simply the distance between two similar points on a wave. Most often wavelength is measured crest to crest or trough to trough. The symbol used to represent wavelength is Greek letter lambda, and generally wavelength is measured in meters. Frequency is simply a rate. It is a measure of how often a wave repeats itself. For example, how frequently a crest is occurring. The Greek letter nu is used to symbolize frequency in an equation. You may have used F in previous classes, so don't be confused. Nu looks a lot like V for velocity on the exam data sheet, but look carefully and you can definitely see the difference. Frequency is most commonly measured in hertz, which is simply one over seconds. The diagram here depicts the electromagnetic spectrum and all the different types of radiation. It is important to point out that all of these types of radiation travel at the speed of light, which is 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Notice the top half shows a representation of wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. Radio waves have the largest wavelengths, while X-rays and gamma rays have the shortest wavelengths. Frequencies are represented on the bottom half of the diagram. Notice the inverse relationship between wavelength and frequency. Large wavelength radio waves have small frequencies. Small wavelength gamma rays have large frequencies. I always think about it this way. The larger the wavelength, the less frequently a crest or a trough is experienced. The relationship between wavelength and frequency can be represented in the following equation, which is on the exam data sheet. Notice the inverse relationship in the equation. Also, take the time to understand what this equation means. The wavelength times the frequency for any type of electromagnetic radiation will result in the speed of light, represented by the symbol C. Keep this equation in mind because we will be referring to it again in a moment. Before we can move on and talk about what led to the next atomic model, we need to go back to Thompson's time and talk about Max Planck and his idea about the relationship between energy and frequency. He observed that every time you would heat an object hot enough to get it to start glowing, it would always give off red light. If you wanted the substance to glow a different color, you would have to keep adding energy. So he thought there must be a direct relationship between the energy of light and the frequency of light. Planck proposed his the following equation. Energy is equal to a constant, called Planck's constant, times the frequency. This equation is actually on your exam data sheet. If you rearrange this equation with the equation for the speed of light, which is also on the exam data sheet, then you get this equation. Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength of light. Planck actually invented the idea of quanta. He says that HF is a quanta of energy. As we will see next, Einstein took this step further and he calls a quanta of light a photon. Planck came up with the idea that energy comes in these little packets. Quite a big contribution when you think about it. Einstein took Planck's ideas and applied it to a phenomenon known at the time as the photoelectric effect. Photo meaning light, electric meaning some type of current. So photoelectric effect literally means light causing a current. Einstein won the Nobel Prize for explaining the photoelectric effect. So without going into drastic detail, we're going to watch a short video about the basics of the photoelectric effect. An explanation of the photoelectric effect is pretty simple. Uh, it's what's observed when light of a certain frequency strikes the surface of a material and electrons are emitted. That is the photoelectric effect. Einstein's explanation of the photoelectric effect proved that light and other forms of electromagnetic radiation are quantized. The explanation that he gave details how light or other types of electromagnetic radiation behaves as a particle. Okay, Einstein called these particles photons. So what we can do with this beam of light here is represent it in such a way where you see particles of light instead of a beam of light. These are photons. What might be confusing here is that you have been taught that light is a wave. Thomas Young's two-slit interference experiment proves that light is a wave. 
This interference of light is shown in the picture on the left. But now I am telling you that the photoelectric effect proves that light is a particle. So which one is it? Well, the fact is, it's both. Light, and all forms of electromagnetic radiation for that matter, has properties of both particles and waves. Now you're most likely thinking, hey, what the heck does this have to do with models of the atom? Well, the next scientist we're going to discuss is going to explain this to you. Louis de Broglie asked what seems to be a very obvious question on the concepts we just discussed. He asked, hey, if light can act as a particle, can particles act as waves? He developed an equation to relate the wave properties of a substance to its particle-like properties. These are the equations he developed. Nothing you need to memorize, but I just want to show you why the wavelength of an electron is important. So, if an electron has the mass given here in the problem, and it moves relatively at the speed given in the problem, what would be the electron's wavelength? If we plug the numbers in and solve, what we would figure out is that the wavelength of an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 10th meters. Well, so what? Is that even relevant? Think about it. The diameter of an atom is on the scale of 10 to the negative 10th meters. The wavelength of an electron is comparable to the size of an atom. That makes the wavelength extremely relevant. This means that the wave-like properties of an electron cannot be ignored when developing an accurate atomic model. All the atomic models up to this point consider electrons to be particles. To get a more accurate model, we must consider electrons as waves. This is what led us to the quantum model of the atom. The first scientist to try to take into account the wave-like nature of electrons was Niels Bohr. He worked with the hydrogen spectrum. When you excite hydrogen gas with an electric current and then observe the light produced through a diffraction grating, you get the spectrum you see here in the lower right. The light diffracts into a red light, turquoise light, and two purple lights. Bohr used this spectrum to develop a new model of the atom. One that explains exactly where the electrons are around the nucleus and why the electrons don't crash into the nucleus. Now, I hope you agree with him and you don't find his work boring. <laughs> so, Bohr's model was quite simple. What he said was that there were specific regions around the nucleus that electrons could occupy without losing energy. The spectral lines that are observed are due to the fact that the electrons are gaining or emitting energy which causes them to move to different locations around the atom. For example, the red spectral line is created when an electron moves from the third energy level, n equals 3, to the second energy level, n equals 2. When electrons move towards the nucleus, energy is emitted, in this case in the form of red light. So when an electron goes from 4 to 2, the turquoise light is produced. From 5 to 2, the purple light is emitted. And from 6 to 2, a deeper purple light is given off. The fact that the electrons are moving in their orbits is what is causing the spectral lines. Remember that one of the limitations of Thomson's model and Rutherford's model was that they could not explain the spectral lines. Or, they could not explain why electrons are not crashing into the nucleus. Bohr's model addresses both of those issues. Bohr's inferences include that it is possible for electrons to exist in certain orbits without emitting electromagnetic radiation. In other words, electrons won't crash into the nucleus. Furthermore, when an electron absorbs energy or gets excited, it is able to jump to an orbit farther away from the nucleus. Now, electrons do not stay excited for long. When the ele excited electron relaxes to its original orbit, it will emit energy in the form of light or another type of electromagnetic radiation. The emitted energy is responsible for producing the spectral lines. Bohr's model provided the specific orbits of the electrons. Now, Bohr's model comes with a pretty big limitation. His model only worked for the hydrogen atom. Also, Bohr was able to define the orbits of electrons, but he still could not explain exactly where an electron is in its orbit. He was still thinking of an electron as a particle, when he should have been considering the wave-like nature of electrons.